Hello everyone, this is Gauthier Lamotte. You are listening to Mutual Knowledge and today my guest is Carl Evans. Carl is an international lawyer and he's also the managing associate at Grisham International and he's working in the field of blockchain as a lawyer. Hi Carl. Hey. I Great to it. be here. Ah, thank you. I love interviewing professionals uh, who are not necessarily entrepreneurs or tech developers because there are so many professionals, um, you know, aside from these two positions. And that's very cool to, to have you here. So we met in Singapore. Yep, we did indeed. What were you doing here? Um, what was I doing in Singapore? I was I was at an event. Um, it's It was one of the few events that uh, we were as a company exhibiting at. Um, I have mixed emotions about exhibiting at events, but this one happened to be great. Um, and I was speaking on stage, as I, I often do, quite a few places, and we managed to bump into each other in uh, in a bit of a side area. It was it was great. Yeah, I love events where there there is a networking area, and for everyone, if you ever go to the blockchain uh, or the blockchain festival uh, events in Thailand and in Singapore, these events have great food and. I remember a very huge, <laughs> very huge buffet at the end. So, Carl, what is it that you do as a lawyer in the field of blockchain? Yeah, um, absolutely. So I, I explain to people, look, being a lawyer is much the same all over the world. So you start as that as your kind of example. But more specifically, when I talk about what I do, uh, me personally, I try and try and work very heavily within the blockchain and what I refer to as digital asset space. Um, I'm a big believer in the space. I'm a big believer in the technology set, big believer in this industry. And I always develop the quirky line of I'm not a uh, lawyer that works in crypto. I am a crypto lawyer. And for me, there's a very big difference. Effectively, what that means is um, I'll be working with companies that are looking to either get into the digital asset space and blockchain tech space those that are already within it. Um, so if you think of you, the likes of your media, marketing, mining, exchanges, um, or those that are typically a financial firms, banks, building societies, uh, institutions like that, who are looking to get into blockchain or digital asset tech, um, usually breaking them into that. What I do in terms of services, service wise, that's why I always start with that. Think of what a lawyer does. It's some of it's very mundane, contracts, negotiation. Some of it's very cool, corporate strategy, planning, development. So it's uh, it's very atypical in a very new age. Mm. All right. So so that means you're helping not only the crypto foundations willing to launch a token, but you're also helping all the people providing the services that hold this industry together on top of the tech, uh, on the tech architecture, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we as a firm uh, and I as a, as a lawyer, we work with some of the biggest media companies in this industry, Crypto Slate, Cointelegraph, Crypto Daily. Um, we do the legals for a lot of those firms. We work with a lot of tier one DEXs, tier one exchanges. As of last month, we started managing a lot of sushi swaps legal. Oh, um, so we really try and work with, yes, we work with the tier one players and that's fantastic. But I always say to my team and I say to people in this industry, we and I try and treat everybody the same. It doesn't matter whether you're tier one. It doesn't matter whether you're you know, starting out on your journey. Everybody gets the same level of service. Everybody gets treated the same. And that, I think, is important in this industry as a whole because I feel like everybody is just awesome and, you know, very welcoming, right? They're like, hey, what are you doing? What are you building? Where are you going? And we have to mirror that in everything we do. Wonderful. Uh, may I ask uh, how and when you went into contact with uh, the blockchain sector? I, I assume you were a lawyer before that, before... I was. Yeah. Yeah, I was. Um, you know, it's interesting. I uh, if, if and this is no plug, by the way, but but uh, if you ever read my book, the li the little book of crypto, um, I kind of elaborate on this story a little bit more. But um, I came into crypto when I was at a house party in California years ago. I uh, I I was at a house party. I actually didn't know anybody there. I was waiting for my friends to arrive. I did what most people do and went out to the garage. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with U.S. culture, the garage is like the the central place of most parties in the U.S. There's usually a fridge out there. <laughs> That's um, true. 
<laughs> I'm, a fr- I'm a French person, but every time I'm, I'm having a barbecue at, uh, at a U.S. home, it's like, why do they do that in the garage? Yep, it's uh, it's a cultural thing I can't explain. If you can explain, you know, uh, answers on a postcard. Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I assume it came like that, it, it, organically, I suppose. Yep, so, so there I am. I'm in the garage, um, and I trip over a mining rig. Um, it's a couple of GPUs rigged out on the floor, attached to a power socket, and... Having been an avid geek all of my life, I'm always very honest about that. I game, I built my own rigs, I used to do some coding. I was like, why do you have a bunch of graphics cards rigged together? And the guy whose party it was went on to explain, he said to me, look, I'm I'm mining Bitcoin. And instantly, you know, I'm kind of like mid-drink, like stop everything and explain all of this to me. What do you mean you're mining Bitcoin? And he was really cool. He went through it. Um, I was, I'm never one of these guys who's like, you know, and I instantly fell in love and I knew it was going to change the world. I did. I, I'm like a lot of people. I found out about it. I did a little research. I found out some more. I found out some more. I found out some more. And at the time I was working with some tech firms in California, um, helping them do what's called the bounce. And that's where you go from California, typically to New York and then onto Europe. That mm. used to be the startup protocol. Hey, we're in California. Now we're in New York. Now we're in London. Watch us grow kind of thing. Um, and so I was helping a lot of companies do that. So then when I went through a very uh, personal circumstance shift, which again, I elaborate a lot on, but basically I found myself sitting on my best friend's couch, um, stone broke in the in the UK. And I was like, what should I, what should I do with my life? So I decided to set up my own firm. Um, and I was about three weeks into, um, and I hope nobody minds me using using this expression, whoring myself out. I was literally doing anything I could do um, at the time. And somebody approached me, a very uh, a firm that was based in Thailand. And they said, look, we, we need to file some trademarks. We need to do some other things. I was like, that sounds great. They were doing something called an ICO. And this was back in 2017. Okay. I was like, wait, what's an ICO? And then this guy explained it to me and then the whole, you know, I know what Bitcoin is. And I was like, well, you guys are building your own and you're selling it. And this is, this is genius. So I ended up um, helping them do all of their legals on their raise. They were a firm called Everex. For those of you who are familiar with it, it was one of the kind of most successful raises of 2017. They still exist today. And uh, I took part payment in token, part payment in cash, and it all worked out very, very well. Shortly after that, I made a decision to, to switch my firm completely to crypto and this was back in 2018 and i said we are we are only doing crypto that is it up until that point we'd kind of done some other stuff we did a little work with crypto we'd done some fringe stuff but that was it we were we were jumping okay. and everybody said it was crazy including a very kind of judgmental father that i have that's a you know <laughs> tell the tell the therapist to park that one up because there's stories for another day but everybody was like what are you doing and that was the origin story so to speak and today i'm proud to say we're considered the largest one of the largest crypto digital asset law firms on the planet um 26 headcount offices in most major continents we work with like i say everybody from startups to big guys and uh, and it's been a great journey and and that's how i ended up where i am today wonderful all right and so question uh I, so I assume um, you started learning on the go, right? You you didn't attend a formal training to to train an already uh, an already certified licensed lawyer uh, to enter that field at this time. No. Yeah. Okay. So how much? It didn't exist. Uh, yeah. How much time did it take you for you to feel confident regarding your expertise? So that is a great question. Um, I am a big believer in transferable skill sets. I think everybody develops skills that can transfer to another industry. And for me, I had this this amazing holy trinity of three things. I had the knowledge of startups where I'd been working with startups before. Um, I had the the legal knowledge of being a lawyer, but I also had the tech geek side of me. And to be able to sit there and go, okay, let's talk about, because before crypto, for those of you who remember, it was all big data cloud tech it was everybody was in that space everybody was look at me i'm developing a cloud-based you know SaaS cloud-based enterprise platform that's low latency database scanning technology and 
I was one of the few lawyers in the room that usually understood what all of that meant. Um, or at least one of the guys in the room, I think. So I had that holy trinity. So when it came to learning about blockchain, crypto, ledgers, all of it, it was a learning curve, yes, but that time was cut very significantly because of the underlying skill set. Because of the, of the, of the, um, the original interests. Yes, yeah, because of the geeky yeah, side uh, of, you know, understanding uh, it. I, I like your, your answer because this is inspiring. I, I assume this is going to be inspiring for our listeners because many people are business people with a high business IQ, but they don't necessarily understand how crypto works. And it's good for them to understand that having that geeky side and having already entrepreneurial or law knowledge, something that already is transferable, um, it, it's possible for them to work in the field of crypto without spending 10 years doing it. We're still in, a, in an area where there's practically no certification or no formal training. So you have to make your training. All yeah, right. 100%. And Actually, and on yeah. that, that's a, sorry to cut you off, that's Excuse a really me. interesting, uh, a really important point. And one thing I always say to people whenever they look to get into crypto um, or any digital asset, anything aligned with blockchain, a lot of people will profess to be an expert. This, this industry seems to lure people of the expert nature. Uh, jokes about LinkedIn profiles aside, right? But um, <laughs> you, you, the reality of it is, I've been in this industry fringe since 2015, full time since 2017. I would never call myself an expert because this industry moves so quickly. Uh, so it, the, the technology sets are so vast. It's, there's a huge amount of open source underpinning everything this is. And when something is open source, For those of you who don't know what that means, it means it's free, it's accessible to use. It, you are literally, the development growth is astronomical. So if you speak with anybody and they're like, and, and I know you share this sentiment as well, and someone goes, hey, I'm an expert, I know everything. I'm immediately like, get up, leave the room. Yeah. Because nobody nobody is an expert in this field. Absolutely. That, but, you know, we, we at uh, Moon are building tech, tech mostly and I'm uh, hosting this podcast of course but uh, every time I see new white papers each white paper is pointing towards a few other papers that I haven't gotten the time to read and it's absolutely not possible for a human being even on a full-time basis to to read uh, all the papers that are published every week and um, <laughs> even more so if you're you're trying to have a job that pays the bills so Of course. Th that's the same thing, I guess, with molecular biology or artificial intelligence. You can't read all the publications. And same thing with climate change. So uh, any person pretending to have uh, to be able to read the whole literature is not, uh, is not able to do that. So, of course, nobody is an expert. And so exactly. we're all, all partial experts and fragmented experts. And from this uh, perspective, what are the use cases that are exciting to you? Hmm. So exciting use cases. I, I'm a big fan of um, mainstream switching from um, standardized financial institutions over to um, blockchain tech mm -hmm. because um, I know there are other great uses of blockchain technology. You park this in the medical field, you park this in transport and logistics, you park this in armaments and defense. It screams applicability. Just, just the technology set works in it very, very well. Mm -hmm. But where I think for me, I, I, this will excel in people's day to day lives yeah. is it is financial transactions. Um, I know people think of that instantly as the use case oh, blockchain, Bitcoin finance. And there's and I highlight all those other subsections because the healthcare industry will be revolutionized by blockchain tech. I mean, it's it's coming. It's happening. Yeah. Um, so will voting, you know, so will governance. There's so many other things. But if we if we park in finance for a second, We speak about central digital currencies. We get all of that. But I think there's a real opportunity here um, for a financial reset. A lot of commentators talk about the great reset, the great financial reset. I don't know if I subscribe to that. I don't think, I mean, to, to reinvent the wheel, I don't think is going to happen. But I think now we have a technology set where, as a great example, if I go into a store and I use my debit card, I'm paying free transaction fees four transaction fees mm -hmm. just for the luxury of spending my money it's insanity if i use a bank account i'm paying a third-party institution for the luxury of keeping my money it's insanity 
Um, when we look at foreign exchange protocol, most people don't realize this, but foreign exchange is governed by five or six major banks. That's why banks like Bank of America, Deutsche Bank, you know, various others, um, OCBC in Asia, there's almost like a master license. So every time I change pounds into dollars or dirhams, every one of those transactions filters back to that bank. And again, it's an it's an archaic institution that's basically designed to make money off people just wanting to use their money. Um, I am not the biggest advocate of taxes. I speak very highly on you know centralized governments and how I feel that there's a there's a big problem with that. More on that um, on my next question. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll park that for the next question. But my point is this: why why should people who work damn hard, because everybody works hard, uh, have to pay money in taxes? and then pay money just to use their money. Blockchain gets rid of an awful amount of those third parties that just don't need to be there. And I think that, for me, would be the biggest shift. Wonderful. And, well, there's one uh, another question before the, the other question about taxes and regulations and so on. But So that means the finance uh, financial institutions will probably use this in a very... Uh, very normal way in a few in a few years less than a decade probably because every major bank has a blockchain initiative what do you think about um, their understanding of the whole blockchain philosophy at the time i mean for example in france we had societe generale uh, mm -hmm. you know that uh, that bank with the red and black logo Yep. These guys published yep. their first blockchain initiative smart contract and one of them was already showing that they had the power to override your your address and uh, so basically you don't own the keys but you don't even own the address and some people already looked at it saying okay well that's government backed and that's central bank backed so of course of course, is going to be uh, not decentralized and it's not going to have the advantages of a regular blockchain. It's just going to save some transaction fees, but nothing else. Uh, do you think it's the case for all these banks or do you think it's just a uh, a few of them who, don't, who are technically not fit to do that? And sub-question, if that's the major agency, do you think that it's because of incompetence or do you think that it's because, you know... <laughs> chase the natural uh, the, the, the chase nature and it comes back yeah this is this is a this is a huge talking point it's a huge talking point internationally um actually my personal perspective on this is right now we are trying to introduce the motor car to the horse i am sure at some point in the past people who had been used to using horses every single day of their life were introduced to the combustion engine Oh, and yeah, they said they, they probably said it was shit and and absolutely not. and it was crappy yep. somehow it was yep <laughs> and and everybody was like absolutely not i'm going to stick with my four legged beast that i know that i understand that i feed i nurture i love i'm not going in this death machine i am sure conversations like that happened the same thing is happening right now people are people like myself like you like entrepreneurs mm -hmm. tech individuals are going to banks financial institutions and we're saying look we can revolutionize this or it will be revolutionized and you can be a part of this journey. And unfortunately, to answer your question, most of those institutions are simply taking this technology and embedding it in what they already use. They're treating it as a tech wave, right? Remember I referenced big data, then we went blockchain and now we're going into AI. You know, we'll see there's these waves. And unfortunately, many banks have something that everybody forgets about, and that's shareholders. Mm. And they have to keep their shareholders happy, so they have to show that they're doing things with new technology, right? Blockchain is a buzzword. I guarantee you, now I don't have data to back this up. I'm a gambling man, and I would take a bet on it. If we went back to you know, 2008, 2009 forward, every bank was talking about, look at our big data look at our cloud-based tech we've just installed in our in our organization this is gonna this is gonna revolutionize our banking then for us it was look at this blockchain protocol we've rolled out this is going to revolutionize our banking and i promise you next week it will be look at this ai infrastructure we're embedding in our banking it's going to revolutionize us mm -hmm. when the reality is the underlying systems swift back or you know all of them fedwire they just their legacy systems they will they will not change them for the foreseeable future because they've only just worked out how to implement and integrate them. 
And that's the biggest problem. Okay, and so do you think some some of this has been done on purpose? Like oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, okay, one hundred percent. Yeah. So so the argument to this is, um, and this is again not a pitch here. Um, Caitlin, who's a fantastic lawyer in the U.S. in Wyoming, tried to create something called Custodia Bank. Custodia Bank was a one hundred percent crypto bank. It only used blockchain technology. They needed a Fed wire access. They needed Fed wire approval, but for the most part, it was purely crypto based. Um, the Fed shut it down. They said, absolutely not. It doesn't comply with all these rules. She's published some fantastic information on why actually it did and how that would have worked in practice. I encourage you guys to go and look at that. But it's a simple example of somebody going, I can create a bank very easily. And we saw this at the beginning of, of the crypto growth. A lot of people said, I could create a bank because all I need to do is create wallet addresses and da 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 da. Um, that is fantastic, but we forget that banks only work as long as they are subject to what the big guys are doing, right? Um, and we've seen this before. We worked with we've worked with banks who I won't name, but we've worked with clients who have gone to go get banking licenses. We can go get your banking license down in Belize. We get your Class B or a Class A, Series A or Series B banking license. You can be a bank in six months if you've got the cash. You can be a bank in six months. You can go, you can apply for a Fed wire access, you can do all this other stuff. But if you don't have access to the legacy systems, you are dead, you are done, you're irrelevant. Mm -hmm. You're a bank owner that doesn't have a bank. So yeah, they've designed it specifically that way. Look, without going too deep down the conspiracy hole, money is power, power is absolute, right? Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. The more that there is people controlling the money, the more power they have. They will never let that go. Absolutely, of course. Of course. So, of course, they're they're going to show a, uh, um, let's say, a scaled down tech blockchain technology to to emulate that a little bit, but not too much. Yeah, absolutely. O okay, and uh, how do you think? Um, so we were talking about the car, right? And of course, the first motor engine the first uh, the first car was so crappy that it could a horse could stand the comparison and nothing like what we have now technically the the current blockchain is kind of crappy it's a very bad user experience everyone i interview and um, you know in this podcast will tell me oh you know user experience is the shittiest part of the blockchain tech um what do you think the the blockchain looks like in a decade mm. so most people um, use the user adapt uh, user adoption chart, right? I don't know if you've ever seen that, but there's a user adoption yes, chart where it goes up, blah blah blah, right? Um, I I actually I love that as a hypothesis, but I think the actuality is very different. What does what does blockchain look like in a decade? Um, for mass adoption to have been achieved, in my mind, things have to run like the motor vehicle. Sticking with the example. And what do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. I mean, 73% of the Earth's population own a motor vehicle. Yeah. 4% of the Earth's population can explain how the combustion engine works. It's the same thing. We will just use blockchain technology as part of our day-to-day -day life. But most people will have no idea how it works. They wouldn't have seen that growth. They wouldn't have seen that adoption. And it may be something as simple as new medical records are now stored on a blockchain and they're transferred between institutions. It might be something as significant as the launch code for missiles. So a soldier on the field plugs in, gets a coordinate, it's done, but it's all done through blockchain. The, the adoption of this won't be as impacting as the motor vehicle, to stick with our example, but it will be as veiled in so much as people will use it, but not actually know they're using it. Wonderful. And so we were talking about regulations and we were talking about taxes. Um, and funny thing, when we met the two of us in Singapore, we realized that we had a double citizenship. A, we have a country in common, because I, if I remember correctly, you are a citizen of the Free Republic of Liberland, right? That's correct, yeah. So from your perspective as a lawyer, what, uh, 
what are the, the things to do for such a country. So uh, for our listeners, I'll leave you guys on Wikipedia. You guys will look <laughs> look it up and look at what Li Liberland is. But to s say it and to sum it up, it's basically a no man's land uh, between Serbia and Croatia that nobody claimed. And so uh, President Vitjedlička planted his flag and then because many people asked for citizenship now we are having basically a blast online and that's a real community with its own airplane um, well with its own tiny non-commercial airline and its own beer of brand and many other things and a uh, few representative uh, representative offices all around the world many people who are very involved so what does it require for such a country using blockchain and cryptocurrency to, you know, uh, guarantee private property to um, to get recognized from your perspective as a lawyer? Mm. So international treaties are one of the most complicated things. Um, all of politics is because everybody sits at some kind of a line. Um, as a great example, Venezuela has recognized the Republic of Liberland. Um, you can use your pop recently you can use your passport to travel there they have i didn't even know that passport. yep so you can you can take a trip now i have not done this i have not tried this but i have been informed you can take a trip to venezuela on your passport um if you are a passport holder now we we have multi-layered and you and i were talking about this before the, the podcast started actually the european political spectrum is a particularly complicated one because it is thousands of years old so land claims and independence claims are nothing new. In fact, they happen, I would argue, every day of the week within the continent of Europe. Um, there is sea land in the United Kingdom. There is the Cornish independence movement in the United Kingdom. There is the Catalonian independence movement in France and Spain. There are so many independence movements. Um, legally, what it starts with, because there's a complex, complex nature, right? There's freedom of individuals and there's freedom of governments governments get their power from individuals and so if the individuals agree the powers should vest right unfortunately it doesn't work like that anymore of course um, in practice it never works like that it, it never works like that so what we have is a situation where um independence because let's be clear this was not unoccupied land it was simply disputed land um the, both countries made a claim on it they had just never settled it so it had been parked and with the evolution of the european union it just didn't matter with free movement of people free movement of borders i assure you if there was a strict immigration policy somebody somewhere would have drawn a border around that island so it wasn't it was classed as a no man's land in the context of two people kind of went well we don't want it that creates the biggest problem right this wasn't an island in the pacific that nobody claimed i would argue that would probably be easier so now you have to get two countries to waive their rights. That doesn't sound like an issue until you realize that the waiving of a land claim, the waiving of territorial claim, sets a very dangerous precedent. Of course. Especially as par far as the European Union is concerned, when there are so many independence movements in the continent of Europe. And you yeah. create a precedent of, those guys did it, we can do it. And so in actuality, both governments probably don't care about a worthless piece of land and i don't mean that leave land is worthless i mean right now there is no infrastructure there is nothing of, of any significant importance of course natural uh, mineral even, even if it were a uh, tiny balcony a balkan singapore what difference would it make on the international stage no, nothing aside from the fact that it shows that it's possible to do it exactly so one of the things i have spoken about is there needs to be a harmonious reason as to why the independence is granted by the two nations and recognized because once that is done it's it's then a domino effect right um and that that creates the biggest issue why would they recognize independence you have to give them a reason for that legally speaking treaties can be signed you could argue that you can sign and i'm not even sure if Liberland has done this and you you may you may know this more than i a declaration of independence and I, I don't know as an actual document exists that says we have declared independence. Well, there is a constitution, but I don't know if there's a declaration of independence. We're, we're going to have Vit Yedlicka, president of Liberland, in a few uh, in a few weeks. As, Good, uh, maybe you as can a ask him. Guest maybe of this podcast, so I'll remember the question. But um, 
it's funny because you were talking about international treaties, and the thing is, you know, the, the Montevideo Convention states that there are four criteria that you have to to uh, respect in order to be uh, a genuine country, whatever the hell that means. Uh, but there are many places in uh, places in the world where these criteria are met and yet the UN doesn't recognize these people. Well, the, the biggest example I have in mind is Somaliland. Um, Thank you. Yep, just south of, Mor uh, just south of Morocco. Uh, okay, so so the thing is the Somali were an ethnic, an ethnic group that spanned from uh, Djibouti to Sudan to uh, Ethiopia and, of course, to all the, the places commonly called Somalia. But because um, many imperialist countries uh, cut borders arbitrarily. Um, there was a French Somalia, a Britain, uh, British Somalia, and, a, and an Italian Somalia. And so the two, two of them remained and were recognized by the UN for a short period of time, the British one and the Italian one. And then because they were ethnic brothers, they fused into a country. And long story short, it didn't turn out as they expected. So Somaliland seceded once again. So a country that has been recognized by the UN at some point, and then that has seceded for very legitimate reasons, which are basically, um, you know, uh, uh, very poor management of assets and dictatorial, uh, dictatorial regime. Um, a country that has three million inhabitants that is safe, that can interact peacefully with other people, whose passport is recognized by many other countries, is not recognized by the UN, but they do have all the, the they do meet all the criteria, and they have been doing so for thirty years, I think. I've been to Somalia, um, to Somaliland, uh, a few years ago for for the twenty seventh anniversary of Somaliland because I was here as Lib Liberland representative, and fu oh, fun story because I had a stamp of uh, Somal uh, Somaliland in my um, Liberland passport. It wasn't listed as uh, as a trip I had on my French passport, but just in case when the U.S. government asked if I had. Uh, been to uh, those seven countries that were banned by the Trump administration. I said, ah, technically, it's not really Somalia, it's Somaliland. But then again, for the UN, for the US, it's more like Somalia. So I don't really know. Okay, it's better to to <laughs> to state it and uh, instead of being accused of lying or something. I, I don't want to be uh, to create yep. any trouble with uh, with uh, the US immigration. So. I, th I said, yeah, I've been to Somalia, and because of that, I was refused. Uh, I couldn't board the plane, so I had to go to the U.S. embassy, and that's why I have a 10 years visa, um, tourist visa for the year for the U.S. At, uh, U.S. at the moment. But the funny thing is, they do meet the, these criteria, and there are many other places in the world, like Abkhazia, who are also recognized. They have their own tiny government. They have the ability to interact in their own territory and their own population. And yet the UN doesn't recognize these people, even uh, even when these people are stable for a few decades, which means that in practice it's not about resp respecting the law; it's about not uh, not questioning the uh, the authority of the UN. Of course, it is. It is. And um, I apologize. It was Western Sahara was the country I had in in my mind, um, which is I don't know this one. It, this is south of Morocco. Um, it's it's. It's disputed territory. It is Moroccan, recognized by the United Nations. Uh, Western Sahara claims its own independence. Um, it's a similar story. Um, the biggest one for me, actually, is, and I think everybody knows this, is Palestine. I think Palestine meets every single criteria um, to be an independent nation and is only referred to as territories. And we can see that political shift where you know if we were to speak about this 20 years ago nobody would have even thought of recognizing palestine as a country but now where there's been a slight political shift mood has changed there's that growing trend to recognize palestine as a country and you're absolutely right in what you're saying there are um self-governing independent self-serving protective nations that look after their people that aren't recognized internationally which is crazy which is which is insane right it's like you and i have the freedom should have the freedom to do whatever we want in this world in theory because that's freedom because if we didn't countries like the united states wouldn't exist let's be real right um uh, lots of countries wouldn't exist and now because there has been a tectonic shift in control 
you're not allowed to declare independence is is kind of mind blowing. Well, I find it very. That's the problem I have with centralization. Is that uh, you know there, there are many people in France criticizing Amazon, for example, or huge billion dollar companies. Um, I think most of the time the criticism is valid. Uh, I have many things um, to say to criticize Google or Microsoft or Amazon. The only problem I have with the people critici criticizing them as well, usually in France, is that they're basically thinking that the state is somehow more virtuous that, than Amazon, you know, to protect the workers, for example. So, yeah, I do believe that it's absolutely insane and unproductive and... Uh, disrespectful to force your employees to well not to force them uh, but to tell your employees yeah you're we're going to pay you minimal wage and you're not going to have time to piss so do wear diapers dude i don't find this sane as a as a psychotherapist uh, mm -hmm. but i do think that any entity that would have the power to force amazon to you know instill uh, bigger Uh, longer breaks any of these countries has more blood on their hands than than any of these big companies so I, i'm totally okay to say that there's a danger uh, danger like uh, underlying you know uh, um, google's power i'm totally okay to criticize microsoft 100%. The, the only 100%. problem is that w what do you want to do do you want to give that power to to dismantle them to the u.s government they're even worse i mean how many genocides exactly. they, how many genocides have been conducted by Uh, by Google at the time or by Amazon Pr yeah. probably uh, less than than probably less than France or uh, than the US or than the UK or uh, and any major government uh, at the, um, at this point of history has so much blood on their hands that I don't f I find the position very questionable when people are th are saying yeah let, let's let's ask the bigger fish to protect us from the smaller fish and then everything's going to be all right Absolutely. Then you, you create, you have, excuse me, you've not created, you've gone down an avenue of, we have joked for years in movies about corporations taking over, mm -hmm. right? We, I feel like we did as kids, you know, we you watch movies like The Terminator and blah, blah, and you know, it's, oh, the corporations have taken over. Let's, let's talk actuality here. These companies, a lot of these companies have a bigger GDP than most of the countries that, that we visit on, on holiday. Most of these most of these companies have things they do things that most people don't even want to talk about. Once upon a time, one of the most publicized things was Pepsi had its own navy. Why oh, did Pepsi have really? a navy? Because yeah, because the the USSR they sold Pepsi at the USSR. They couldn't pay its or the former USSR, excuse me. They couldn't <laughs> pay its. They couldn't pay its bill. You can Google this. This is the whole story. Okay, Once yeah, time, I'm totally Google. I believe the, you. The but, uh, Pepsi that's... Corporation had, I think it was the seventh largest seventh largest navy in the world. And we joke about that stuff, but now, and, and I don't want to touch on a sore point because I don't like to talk politics, but if we look at a company called the Wagner Mercenary Group that operates in Russia and has a mandate from the government to operate internationally, that's a corporation operating as an industrialized military arm. Mm. And we know, we know same companies exist in the United States as well. We just don't name them because they're a lot, you know, they're a lot more black ops or whatever the term is. But here's the reality. There's now this bizarre, harmonious relationship of corporations and government having to work together because they're, they're as big as each other. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's insanity. I, I, I do not really um, like the narrative saying that it's corporations or the government. I, I think in some way it's more like, uh, are you willing for the prosperity of your business to be very coercive or are you willing to be... Uh, the least coercive, uh, co coercive uh, as you, as you can. Uh, well, uh, as you, uh, are you going to to are you limitless in your in your propension to be coercive, or um, are you okay to to try to to restrain yourself a bit uh, so that profit is not everything? Uh, and in this case, I don't I don't trust the government, but I don't trust my neighbor as well. I mean, small m m many people criticizing corporations just uh, you know it's the 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 joke like oh, but 
Gerald is very, very faithful to his wife. Yes, but Gerald is ugly. Yeah, same thing for like, <laughs> yeah, Gerald do, does criticize the big corporations and he doesn't scam anybody, but he's too dumb to scam anyone. So it's exactly. not virtue. It's, um, so. Exactly. The, the, the concept comes from, you know, when you can do something and you shouldn't. Uh, um, it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was, uh, it, and it's, and it's very, look, it's a very, very important point that, that circles is black to back to blockchain, right? One of the things about blockchain is it's open source, it's immutable, it can't be altered. And that in the prospect of ironically, what we're talking about is terrifying to a lot of these companies. Imagine if they had to list every single transaction. Imagine if the balance sheet of a corporation, if a ledger was all done on blockchain and every single one of their transactions had to be shown. Of course. How terrifying. Now, for you and I, as small business owners, as operators, we don't care. We don't care. It's, it's already, we're already basically monitored by the state on an everyday basis. Exactly. Exactly. You, you, you could have anybody from the US IRS to the UK HMRC to the you know, French National um, uh, Taxation Authorities to just, hey, we want to take a look at you. Show us everything. And so, and yeah, go ahead. They can. So, so, Many people in the field of blockchain think that, uh, yeah, the genuine blockchain tech can scare governments and big corporations alike and bring a, well, a freer world. Let's hope so. Um, many people, left wing and right, right wing alike, think that it's an empowerment tool against corruption. How would you imagine a sane arbitrage system in... Um, in a world where basically everyone trusts the blockchain technologies and I'm saying technologies and not just one technology. Um, sure. Because basically when you're using the blockchain, you are trusting the processes. You're not trusting a third party, which is the good part of it. But that, that also means you're trusting the, pro the protocol. Um, how would you imagine an arbitrage system? Um, I know that some people did that, like Cleros, Decenturion, and um, and many other um, other companies trying to build decentralized justice. But you, as a lawyer, how would you imagine a functioning so society um, if you can't force a person to abide by some kind of uh, of arbitrage? How do you manage to do that? What what would be the consequences if a person says, "Yeah, I don't want to refund you," and "Yeah, my reputation is broken on this network, but I don't care. I, I I'll keep the money." Or how would you imagine those people working with each other to, to solve that problem? Mm. Uh, okay, if so there's blockchain. no court system forcing the person to, uh, to compensate the, the mistakes done. I, I know that a centralized court can be very shitty because it can also not protect you from, uh, from many criminals. That's what it does. Uh, but aside from just saying that, yeah, benefit, uh, benefit risk ratio is, is in favor of blockchain, Are there genuine solutions to, to prevent that on the block, in the blockchain world for a lawyer like yourself? The answer is 100%. Um, why, why am I so sure of that? Because right now, the court system does not work. It <laughs> does not work. Um, categorically. I, as a lawyer, I, as a representative of the court system in a number of countries, can admit that. It fails for a number of reasons. Um, cost being one of them. If you take the United States, the barrier to entry is cost. It's too expensive. Mm. If you take the United Kingdom, it is too backlogged. If you take the UAE, it is too midline justice, mm. or it is too weighted in favor of the nationals of the country. Um, there are various reasons why justice in its current form doesn't work, because it is justice inherently has to be subjective but everybody forgets that there has to be a line of objectivity with it. A lot of things are black and white. There is, there is, there is black and white. There is not black and white. And we could go down a whole rabbit hole of strict liability offenses versus blah, 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 versus blah, blah. It's, it's, it's a whole thing. But when you introduce blockchain, something like blockchain, what you're doing is you are opening it to public scrutiny, but actualized public scrutiny, which is hugely important. So with a great example of this, um, the United States publicizes every single court case that happens, unless there's special rules. You can go on a docket right now, you can Google somebody's or docket, search somebody's name, and you can see every court case they've ever been involved in, right? It's completely public information. In the United Kingdom, that does not exist. Court 
is at, maintains a level of privacy. Documents are only prepared for the court. But what if what if everything that happened was publicized? And what if there was an actuality of objectivity included mm. in the whole process? Right. That would be so. So the final decision making protocol was a judge. And something that a lot of countries have started doing now is something called mandatory alternative dispute resolution. And I will tell you right now of a lot of the matters that I have handled before they've even got to court, the easiest way to resolve it is to have the parties talk to each other. Hmm. Because what happens is you get this, my, here's my battle line, here's your battle line, here's my lawyer, here's your lawyer, here's my guys, here's your guys, and everybody, and it just becomes, it becomes a measuring contest. It really does. Um, and most problems can be resolved by talking. And you don't need to have somebody talking in a room. This is where the this is where the courtroom has gone. Because if you think of what a courtroom is, it's a place to adjudicate. It's a place to judge issues, right? Yeah. And there therein lies the first first issue. The person in charge of proceedings is called a judge. They are judging you. They're not a resoluter. They don't resolve issues. They're not a we have mediators, we have other things, but they are judging you. We are physically judging the facts. I am judging you, right? Which is very problematic because now it's all about the dance. I have a lawyer. I can speak well in a courtroom. I have to do things in a specific way. I have to submit forms in a specific way. I have to manage things in different ways. And that sounds great, but it's horrifying. Mm. It's terrifying that if I have a dispute with you, the only way that we have to without any alternative dispute resolution, which is run by companies, interestingly, uh, is to go before a judge, is to go before somebody that wants things done in a certain way, in a specific way, in a specific management. You can't just sit there and go, Your Honor, because you show reverence, Your Honor, hey, look, I have this issue. I paid this guy this money. It should have been dealt with. End of conversation. You can come back and say, well, I'm keeping it because of X, Y, Z. And the judge goes, that's great. In theory, the whole process should be should be easy right it's a dispute it's managed i get some are complex but at the end of the day it should be managed so so the u.s introduces an extra layer into things they introduce a jury hmm. so the u.s places juries in everything they hit civil or criminal the uk only has them in the, the, the criminal aspects of things so there's a whole new issue you're not convincing a judge you're convincing 12 people and and in an age where you and i can be in respective cities in various different parts of the globe why should i be judged because that's what it is i'm being judged by a jury of my peers now why is why is 12 why is there 12 why should there be 12 in a world where there can be where i could i could in theory sit at work and adjudicate an issue why does it have to be a judge why can't it be an ordinary person hmm. there's so many questions that the the blockchain is the is the reason I go down this tangent is because blockchain is the cornerstone of that. When you can introduce a decentralized, subjective and objective protocol into something, why is it subjective and objective? Well, it's objective because the protocol exists. It's subjective because it relies on the people that use it. That gets more into the spirit of what adjudication on a matter actually is. And you see this right now in a lot of DAOs. A lot of DAOs can adjudicate on issues using blockchain technology, using votes, and cast the decision on an issue as it comes forward. Mm. That's it's, wonderful. So that, that means that the the next two or three decades, if we if we have more blockchain in our lives, the next two or three decades are going to be thriving in terms of creativity to to find new dispute resolution systems to to build something on top of the actual of the current system right 100 percent. what if i don't what, what if i don't want a let me ask you this question and there's no there is no nationality in position there is no racism there is no no ill intent in this proposition i'm putting forward but if and we see this a lot if i am a european businessman doing business in the uae with another european businessman and we go before a judge who is born and raised in the uae and people born and raised in the uae are very astute they are fantastic people 
they're not going to understand the cultural references to how we may have done business. And we did business in the UAE because it's tax advantage. It's, there are many advantageous reasons as to why we would have done business there. But now something has gone wrong despite the fact that we may have registered free zone offshore companies there, which technically don't fall under the jurisdiction of the centralized government, we now have to go before a judge of that nationality and decide factors. And that becomes quite problematic because now we miss an entirety of a cultural piece that's missed, mm -hmm. that is done in business that we see, and people should be free to add a cultural element to their business it's why people go to certain countries to do business. It's exactly the reason why they do it. And that's okay. That's really cool. But you miss that. And things like blockchain can bring that back in. Hey, I'm a British business dude. I'm doing business with a European business dude or, or lady in the UAE. And we've decided that actually we think a peer, a judgment of European people should decide this. But we don't want to go to a court in Luxembourg or Paris or wherever because it's too expensive. Blockchain absolves all of that it gives people a verified ability to actually mediate manage deal with issues they want and what that does is that frees up the courts for actual tangible issues that need to be decided for the citizens of that country that's a huge thing oh thank you so much that's very inspiring for the future and i think this wraps it up very nicely perfect thank you, thank so, you much, so much huh? for having me i appreciate it. this has been great That's cool. Um, well, thank you. And uh, thank you, everyone. You were listening to Mutual Knowledge. Our guest today was Cal Evans. Um, look him up. You can see all his links in the description of this video. Thank you so much, Cal. Thank you, guys.